here we go. Thank you all for, for being here, and especially to Omar and uh, Mama Jay, <laughs> Jacqueline Hollows. Uh, this uh, webinar was set up by Christian Olsen. Uh, Christian uh, was, unfortunately, not in, here anymore, um, a very energetic person. He, is, uh, he was the, uh, the inspirator to, to so many, many things, including the uh, a trilogy of books, uh, Life Has Your Back. The last one just uh, came out this uh, weekend. And uh, now there's a sticker on, on all of them uh, saying uh, in loving memory of uh, Christian. Um, so first time I uh, got notion of uh, Beyond Recovery and uh, Jacqueline Hollows was uh, when uh, Christian uh, put up a, a meeting, a conference in Denmark with the uh, local uh, jail authorities, criminal force on in Danish. And uh, Jacqueline and I think Paul was over as well. Uh, uh, Susan Marmot came. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So uh, um, these uh, three fantastic people, as well as a lot of Danes and uh, these people from the authorities, uh, had one day to uh, get inspired by, by Jacqueline and uh, the others. Um, and I, I know that you are still in a little bit of contact with uh, one of the people that was there. Yes. That you can come back to a, a little bit later. I've been uh, trying to get in contact with her, but uh, it, it didn't work out. Um, yeah, um, there'll be uh, the possibility to ask uh, a little bit later, but uh, I'm so curious about uh, Omar, if uh, you could uh, start up with uh, your meeting with uh, Jacqueline and uh, the other people in Beyond Recovery. I'm very curious about that one. I appreciate it. Um... My name's Omar Wilson, and as, as of now, I'm the director of Beyond Recovery. Obviously, it wasn't always that way. It, it, it came from like a long hill where it toppled down and I finally found my way. And for me, it all kind of started from a young age when I was diagnosed with ADHD and dyslexia. And I was a very naughty kid, so when I was diagnosed, that gave me my excuse and I kind of used that through my young years and I was caused havoc in school and my mum was always at the school and I kind of met this friend he was older than me and he kind of guided me in a way and he he showed me how to roll and how to still be cool but not do the stuff everybody else was doing and he kind of looked after me and he was killed and he was actually a really good guy and he never done half the stuff I did, but he was a good guy and he was killed by mistaken identity. So my mind frame from there was, there's just no point of me trying to be good because stuff like that will happen anyway. So I took the bad route and I ended up selling drugs for about oh, 10 to 11 years. And a result of that was I went prison because they did this big operation on, on us because we was quite big in Newham and they did this big operation on us and about 16 of us went to prison. And that was my first time in prison and things didn't really change once I hit prison. I was still selling drugs. I was still a nuisance. I was still doing whatever I was doing, but because it was my first time in prison, I told one of the key workers, just put me on every single course. Like, I don't care what course it is, just put me on every single course because I want to be out of my cell. So this happened, she put me on loads of courses and I went to these courses and they were just really repetitive. And my attention span is tiny anyway. So as soon as I just lose 
that little concentration after five minutes, I'm I turn into the class clown and I start laughing and making jokes and just doing silly stuff and I, I love to laugh. I love it. <laughs> so anything to laugh, I'm doing it. We're laughing. So that was like my career throughout all the groups and I spent a lot of time on um, basic, which is they take your TV away and you're banged up for 23 hours. And I, I done a lot of that and because I, I, I was just a nuisance. And then I came across uh, Beyond Recovery and I saw all these smiley ladies and it, it was just weird because we're in prison, but every, like these lot are smiling. So the only excuse I had for their smiling is they're going home tonight and I'm not going home tonight. So that's why they're smiling. And that was my reason. And I kept that reason stubbornly, but I kept it. So I entered this room and one of the first things that was said was during this course, you don't have to remember anything. You don't have to write anything down. You don't even have to get it. Just kind of, um, it's kind of like a feeling type of thing. Um, I can't remember the specific word, but she said it was a feeling. Kind of listen for that feeling. And that was weird for me because I've never heard that in my life. So I, that still didn't grab me in. I still had my class clown mold on. I was ready to give them the class clown until Jacqueline kind of got me with this curiosity. There was this question she asked. And the basics of she had um, a dispute with her son about money and he was meant to pay her back and he didn't. So in that, who made her upset? And this is the question she asked to the group. In this argument with her son, when he was meant to pay her back and he didn't, who made her upset? And of course, all the lads in the room, they're like, oh, it's your son, he made you upset. And we're giving her plans and we're telling her how to sort it out. And we're all going off task, off topic. And she brought it back in the room and she said, like, no. Like, and when she said no, now we wanted to know what it was. And that curiosity is special. It was so special because I never had no judgments. I never had no, I never had my own opinion. I never had nothing. I just wanted to listen to whatever she said. And whatever happened after that, I'll, I'll deal with that. But with the curiosity, I just wanted to listen. And I only noticed now that was actually being so present. You just want to listen. So she said it was her. Now, I'm curious, but I'm, I'm curious beyond my belief because I think she's crazy now. Now I'm saying, how is it you and not him when all my life I know it's him? And then during that call, she kind of broke it down to me. And I consider myself very hard headed. So if you tell me fire's hot and it'll burn you, I would have to put my hand in there just to know it's hot and it burns me. So I feel like I did that with the principles and I kind of experimented with them. And one of the greatest ones for me was within one of those bad times where they took my TV and I was banged up for a long time and Jacqueline gave me these big books and stuff and I was never gonna read them. But with this time to myself, I thought, let me just try. And in the space of like two weeks, I taught myself to read and write. And I found out that I love reading books. And for the best of 24 years, I would have told you, that's not me. I, I hate that. I have ADHD and dyslexia. We're not, we don't do that. Well, I found out that that was just something I made up and carried for the best of 24 years, but it wasn't true. Because here I was sitting in prison, enjoying the hell out of a book can't wait to go back to my soul to read the next chapter and and I was enjoying it and I just I loved reading and even till now I still read and it was ever since then I've kind of just experimented with it experimented with it tried it and just implicated it within my life and it's been beautiful and then to even work with Beyond Recovery now and do the same thing with other people and see them kind of go on their journey and get things for themselves it's just so beautiful. Oh. 
Thank you so much. What a what a what a journey. <laughs> what a journey. Uh, people, if you have questions, uh, don't hesitate. Just unmute yourself and, and put them to uh, the speaker, whether it's uh, Omar or Jacqueline. Just unmute yourself and, and come with the questions. And we love questions, so really don't don't be shy. Hi. Hi, Mete. I have a question to Omar uh, because um, fantastic uh, what you are telling. But where in this process did you stop doing the wrong things? I think that is, is nice to hear because it it has happened somewhere in this. So for me. In, in the reality that I created, there was no other options for me. Like I tried work and I would always get fired or something would happen and my ego would come out and I would argue with somebody and I would, I would never maintain a job. But I was very good at selling drugs, very good at selling drugs. So it was easy for me. But that's what I created in my reality, that that was easy. And just staying in a job was hard. So as humans, we're naturally kind of going to do the easy things because they're simple, they're easy, they're nice. But because I know I created that now, it only kind of really hit me when I left prison. Because when I left prison, I'm back to the same friends, I'm back to the same area, the same community where everybody's selling drugs and everybody's kind of caught up in that man frame. And when I came out, some of my good friends offered me some drugs like hey do you know what take it back get yourself back in get yourself some money feed your family and for them that was a really good gesture but for me i didn't see that as that is my only option anymore i saw past that like if i can do this with drugs i can do this with clothes i can do this with a water bottle i can do this with pencils i can do this with any commodity it doesn't just have to be drugs. And that mind frame there freed me from going back there because it's not the only thing I had. It's not the only choice. I have a million choices. If I want to become a salesman, I don't, I'm not limited to drugs like I thought before. So I feel like when I came out of prison, that's when it kind of, it naturally kicked in because it just didn't feel right anymore. It, it, it wasn't a choice or a conscious choice. It just didn't feel right anymore. It just wasn't my go-to. So that's when I left it alone. And I kind of struggled with some jobs after that, but um, I got in contact with Beyond Recovery and started working with them. And I'll add a little bit to that story. Um, that just a few months ago, like Beyond Recovery, as, as you may know, is it's a social enterprise and... Uh, we struggle for financing and especially since COVID and the prisons have been closed and so on and and we really struggle and um, Omar was doing a lot of volunteering with us and he uh, has two little children, two little girls, one just born recently and so he, he needed to earn some money and so we had this heart to heart, didn't we? Omar. I call him Wilson, by the way, so that's why I stutter over his name. Um, so we had these heart to heart and um, Omar was saying, well, you know, I'm going to have to uh, get a job. And I'm looking at this job with with Amazon or with a driver or, or, or whatever. And it never occurred to him that he could go back to his old his old job of drugs, selling drugs. It just didn't. And I said, Wow, look at that. You're not even considering that as an option anymore. And it, it, only in that moment, wasn't it, that Omar said, I never even thought about that. <laughs> even in the very difficult circumstances that he was finding himself in. So to me, it demonstrates the power of people understanding where how their reality is created and where their well-being is coming from and where their potential is coming from because that once that power is alive within you 
then those, those other things just don't look like an option anymore. So much so that this new struggling life becomes a normality of just, well, this is just how I have to live until I sort out what I can do, um, you know, to, to, to earn money in a, in a good way. Thanks for putting that. I forgot about that. Yeah, because <laughs> it's so normal to you now. Yeah. You don't even think about it. I think that's what I love because it's not like I tried to stop selling drugs. <laughs> it just naturally fell away. And I can see if it could happen with that, it could happen with anything else, to be honest. For yeah. sure. So it's, uh, it's just a continuation. When did you stop use yourself? Pardon? Did you use drugs? When did so I was smoking a lot of weed. I never really touched the hard drugs. I was always scared of drugs because I kind of saw what it did to people. So I was always scared of it. But I did smoke a lot of weed for a long time. And I kind of, about three years ago now, or two years, about two years ago, I stopped smoking weed. And that was just like natural as well. Just one day, I just couldn't be asked. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Meta. Great questions. Anybody else for now? Jacqueline, if you could uh, just uh, walk us through uh, how you got the idea to uh, um, create Beyond Recovery these, yeah, some years ago now. Yeah, sure. Um, so I was, my story is that I was a professional working in the information technology field. And I have worked, worked really hard all my life to get qualified and get, get a higher job and get a higher job and get a, a higher job all the time. And partly my drive was because I never felt good enough. I always felt that I had to prove myself and I always felt that, you know, more qualifications will prove myself, and more better job will prove myself. Um, and I uh, suffered with a, a lot of um, sort of social anxiety, like fe feeling that people, you know, I thought I was quirky and a bit strange and that people thought, thought I was crazy and, and so on. So, I used to drink very heavily. And so my, my drugs, if you like, were drinking and working hard. <laughs> I was addicted to work <laughs> and qualifications. And I um, went through a very difficult patch in my life where um, the housing market crashed and I lost everything that I had. And I, um, well, but basically I was, I was sofa surfing, you know, I didn't have anywhere to live, um, had no car, um, lost my job um, just because of redundancy. And I looked at my life and thought, I don't, I don't really like my life, you know, like I've had suicidal uh, attempts in the past as well, not since my son was born, well, only once since my son was born, but he's 31 now, you know, but I, I didn't like my life. It was, it was a struggle. And so when all of this happened and I lost everything, it looked to me like an opportunity. It looked like instead of being something that I thought was a bad thing, I thought it was a bad thing for a little while. And then eventually when it all went, I was like, I could do anything now. I could do anything that I want to do now. I could, I could, you know, work on a boat and go around the world or something. I could literally do anything because I have no responsibilities. I have no nothing to pay. You know, I so therefore I could do anything. And so I was looking for what could I do. And one of the things was that I had never thought about that I could be someone that could make social change. So I could see that there was a problem with homelessness, 
there was a problem with uh, crime, there's a problem with addiction, but I never thought of myself as someone that could do anything about those things. And during this time, it occurred to me that perhaps I could, perhaps this is something that I could do because I no longer cared about the status and the, um, the salary and so on, you know, I didn't, didn't need it anymore. And so I met someone who had been a heroin addict and I'd come across this understanding. So I, 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 that was helping me during this time. And I started to meet other people who had been in prison and been addicted to, to all sorts of drugs and in all sorts of sticky situations. And um, I actually thought they were amazing. Like I actually saw how creative they were and very determined and very um, persistent and how they would, um, I mean, basically, you know, sometimes people who are drug, uh, who misuse drugs will literally go to the end of the earth to get a, a fix. And I didn't see that as a negative thing. I saw it as a, like a real resilient thing because they would do anything to get what they needed to get. And I could see that if people knew that those things were natural, that actually that they were resist, resilient rather than being an addict with a disease, that it would be helpful to them. And so I started working voluntary in the community and going to groups and, and, and so on for a couple of years. And then I was introduced to a man who ran a substance misuse program in the local prison and he asked me to come along for a meeting and then um, I ended up doing a presentation there, there it was just some luck as well because in the local council there was an underspend uh, in the financial budget so um, there was money to pay for a new intervention and I was friends with I don't know if you know Jack Pranksky, but I was friends with Jack Pranksky and, and he uh, offered to help me make this project into a research project. So I ended up with a 12 month contract working in a prison um, and with the ability to research it as well. And so it's really no different from Omar's story because people think when they when I talk about my business and everything they think that you know maybe I followed some steps and then I did this and then I did that and of course when we look back we can join all the dots up and say oh this happened and then that happened but really and truly I was feeling my way I didn't feel very good about my lifestyle previously I'd um, spontaneously gave up drinking no effort at all um I was happier in myself. So I started to see opportunities and ways that I could be of service in the world. And I think our stories are exactly the same, really. Is that, does that, that you answer your question? Indeed, indeed. What was it, Omar was gonna say something, I think. I was gonna say 100%, it's just like the, the same roots, really. It's the same route. We just thought of different things, but we use the same, at the same system yeah whatever we created yeah yeah i have a question to you also okay Mette. you're good with the questions we like that <laughs> when was it you you met this understanding uh, maybe i didn't listen very good but i did not uh, catch that and eventually from whom um, so I met this understanding in 2012, um, accidentally from Michael Neal from the super coach. Um, he was, he had one weekend, he wasn't doing free principles, this understanding. He was, he had one weekend where he introduced George and Linda Pranksky. And, um, that's, that's how I came across it. And, and I didn't like it though, Mete, I thought it was a cult. <laughs> and, I, and I thought that 
everybody was crazy saying this you know these things happen and these things change I was like yeah okay <laughs> um and then and everybody was smiley as well <laughs> so it's like, there's something wrong here <laughs> and then accidentally uh because I didn't like it I didn't study it I didn't follow it I didn't believe in it um but at the same time I was going through all these difficult things but I wasn't I was I was okay with it all and so I hadn't realized that I'd been impacted I hadn't realized that I had you know found my own resilience and and contentment um I just noticed that I was less stressed and I was less um less sort of worried and less anxious and as as things went along and I I met all the these people in recovery I um started to talk to them about you know how our minds work and how you know what do you think about this thing about reality comes from inside your head I asked them you know and I talked to them about it what do you think about this because these people have done a lot of therapy and a lot of other work so they had a you know they had a whole raft of things that they could talk about and I started to see it in them I started to see that oh wow like some people would um you know they would be free from drugs but they would be completely anxious about their life because they swapped the drugs for you know anxiety <laughs> and they were making up a different reality but we, we were different you know, taking them in the same route. And so I started to see the principles through them. And I also started to see the potential of the principles through them. Um, and one day I was talking to a group of people and I was just thinking about how amazing they were and, you know, incredible and funny and everything else. I, I love them. I really love them to bits. And I kept telling people, but you're amazing, you know, you're amazing. And then one day I thought, well, if they're all all right and they're all, they all have all this potential and they're all amazing, I must be too. <laughs> so <laughs> I was like, oh, and then I woke up and I realized like everyone is, we all have it. We just get caught in our own little made up world that we don't. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Please come forward. Jakob looks like he wants to speak. <laughs> <laughs> Jacqueline, what is the most awkward situation you have been in with the three principles? Oh. Most we awful. have to find something else that, that you don't speak about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nice one. Nice question. Good question. Uh, that's like a Wilson question, that is, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. I, have you heard the chick story? Nope. Okay. So uh, thank you, Wilson. Um, so in 2015 is when I went into prison. And um, at that point, I knew that, I knew very little. So I knew that everybody has this untapped potential within them and that we make our reality in the moment. But I really didn't know anything else. And I was felt, felt very uh, underprepared so I read and read and read and brought loads of books into prison and everything. And when you get inducted into working, is, does anyone here work in prison? No. When you get inducted into working in prison, um, prison can be a dangerous place. Like people, people who have done dangerous things all get put in the same place together to live together. And, you know, it can be a bit of a melting pot of, of anger and angst and people are locked up for a long, long time. And 
uh, it's not a nice place. And so when you get inducted, you get a lot of training about how, how dangerous it is. And um, they show you cabinets full of, um, you know, an innocent looking pen that's been turned into a, a knife that they call a shank or, um, uh, and, and there are hundreds of them, or they tell you um, what to do if somebody, if you find somebody hanging in their cell, um, or what to do if you're taken hostage. So when you go to work in prison, first of all, they frighten you to death. And, um, and then they give you some keys, and they let you go work in there. <laughs> so on my first day in prison, and that, you know, I had about six months of going through all sorts of vetting procedures and so on. I was set up standing in front of my classroom. Um, so we had a classroom that is based on the wing where the men live. Um, so it's very noisy and uh, very smelly um, and, you know, not, not very nice. <laughs> And I was standing there in my, in my little uniform with a, with a clipboard with all my names on it. And at the weekend, there'd been this massive uh, incident at the weekend. And when there's an incident in prison, basically the first thing they do is lock everybody up. So everybody was locked up. And so imagine this then, it's June. It was in summer in June. It's hot and... I don't know, about a hundred men on a wing, um, around about a hundred men living in this, in this accommodation in tiny cells of like six by four or something, you know, like a tiny little cells with tiny little windows uh, with bars down them. So no air con, <laughs> no, no fans even, nothing, just hot and smelly and horrible. And they'd been locked up all weekend so I'm standing there on Monday morning with my clipboard and all the men are, they've got their cups and they're rattling the cups on the, on the doors and making a lot of noise and shouting. And I thought, oh, it's just like the TV, you know, it's like, <laughs> what's going to happen? And what am I doing here? Uh, you know, I thought I should be on a beach in Hawaii or something. And there I am in this smelly prison. And I was scared. I, I was scared and I, and I thought about all the things that they taught us during the training. Anyway, so uh, the, the radio goes off and the guard comes around and he unlocks all the, all the doors one by one and all the men come out and they're all shouting and they've got no tops on and they're all running around getting toast and things. And um, if you're a girl in prison as well, you're a bit of a novelty right because like you're a girl it doesn't really matter what you look like or how old you are you're still a girl so you know everyone wants to come and talk to you and they're interested in what you're doing so I was very phased very very phased and and I felt very intimidated and not prepared and this man came up to me and in my eyes he looked like a prisoner you know, he was a big man. He had like a flat head. He had a big tattoo on his neck. He looked rough to me, like what I would say looked rough. Um, and he came came up all, all big and intimidating. And he said, can I come in? And one of the things that you're taught is you're not allowed to let anyone in who's not on the list. Like that's the big, big rule that you're not allowed to do that. So I looked on my list hoping that he wasn't on it and I asked him his name and he, he told me his name and I looked on the list and I said oh your name's not on the list and he went it's all right I want to see the chicks <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if in Denmark but chicks is slang for women in in England and so I thought oh well, <laughs> and what do I do right he wants to look out the window at the female officers that are lined up and so anyway I let him in because I didn't know what to do <laughs> so, so I said yeah okay <laughs> so he came into my room and the flip charts was in front of the little tiny window with the bars 
and he moved the flip chart out the way. And I was really scared. I thought, I don't know what I, I don't know what to do about this big man. And, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. And he moved the flip chart out of the way. And on the window ledge, you could see the barbed wire and you could see the, the grounds. And on the window ledge was a nest where the dove had laid eggs. And he was waiting for the chicks to hatch from the eggs. <laughs> and he told me that he was out in two weeks and he wanted the chicks to hatch before he got out because he wanted to make sure that they were okay. I mean, and the nest was like a prison nest. It was, it was, it was horrible, wasn't it? Oh my, it was like all sticks and, you know, I mean, just like proper prison nest, but the dove, the dove liked it. And for me, Kim, it was a blessing because when that happened, I suddenly saw that here I was in a place where I wanted to be because I felt drawn to work with these guys. And I felt like it was my purpose to be there. And here I was with all this judgment, all this invisible thinking about being a prisoner and being rough and you know what it all meant and what did he mean and with all this fear and anxiety and it all dropped away like all of that thinking and it was totally invisible to me I just didn't even know I had it and then he shone a light on it and I realized like there's this big burly guy with a tattoo on his neck and I'm already making up judgments about him and all he wants to do is look at the the chicks on the windowsill that's pretty much my, yeah, you are right, Wilson. That is my <laughs> most awkward. <laughs> I love that story, man. I do. I really do. <laughs> but he saved the day. He saved the program. I wouldn't be sat here. To, I don't even remember his name, but I would not be sat here today if it hadn't been for that gentleman because he showed me how I was turning up with this judgment and this invisible thinking. And because he showed me that, when the men came, I didn't judge them. You know, I just loved them. Like I, I, I'd loved the other people that I'd worked with. I just realized like what I'm seeing and what I'm, what, first of all, what I'm seeing is, is made up because I'm seeing through my judgment. And second of all, their behavior isn't who they really are. You know, so they, they were naughty and they jumped about and they did all sorts of naughty things, but their behavior, whether it's naughty or whether it's criminal, isn't who they are. That's just their behavior in a moment. And then they get labeled with that. And then that's it forever. Again, every, everybody judges that character then. But I'm, I, I'm so glad that my behavior isn't me, right? I'm so glad that the times that I've lost it and shouted and been horrible and not been a good mom or not been a good wife and you know not been a good friend sometimes um I'm glad that people aren't looking at me and going oh yeah that's who she is um so why would we do that to other people yeah on uh Funen, we we got a, a a couple of prisons as well but uh, one of them is uh, a semi-open one they introduced uh, puppies to people to raise. Nice. So they, uh, I think it was about five puppies that were all uh, given to one of the hardcore persons. And they shifted from being these hard guys to being the caring parent of um, these puppies. Nice. Quite amazing. Yeah. That just uh, drew my mind when you said the, the, uh, the ducks. Yeah, yeah. And I, I've seen some of those, um, those experiments or tests. And, you know, I've heard guys talk about how um, they've had like a stray dog 
-hmm. and they are they resonate with the stray dog because the stray dogs had a hard life and they've had a hard life and so they care for each other they save each other it it brings it comes back to nature right Mm -hmm. omar and i talk about nature it comes back to nature and that the nature seeing within each other seeing itself within each other like that's what um i feel like that's what animals do they just let you know how to be present because with an animal you don't really think about the past or the future you're literally just present with an animal Mm. and when you see an animal they're just present in the moment whether they're sleeping doing this do it they're just present in the moment so i feel like that just rubs off Um, very soon, it's a year ago, I was uh, so lucky that my eldest son had a son. And you get the same with babies, I can tell you. Yes. They're just present. <laughs> such, as Dick Ben just says, such amazing teachers, these small babies. Yeah. They remind yeah. you pure you once was and how pure you can be yeah because that is that our our natural state and how resilient they are you know like they just things they they can be absolutely traumatized and then and then happy and laughing the next minute (laughs) you know they see they see their moment to moment reality and then it's gone and then they're in it, and then it's gone. This one is for, for you both. Um, how do you actually uh, perform your teachings in prisons? How is it so very different from uh, the traditional psychologists and so on? Personally, I feel like we don't, well, for me personally, Jacqueline didn't know anything about me, anything. She didn't know anything about my past, my ADHD. She didn't even know why I was in prison. And I feel like she just spoke to me as a human. And I don't think I was ever spoken to like that before. And even if I was, I didn't, I wasn't aware of it. So there was, I know that with just pure love and no judgment, she spoke to me and the true me. And I feel like that's where we differ from others because we see past all the judgment and everything and we just talk to the person because a lot of times we have a mask. And where I grew up, I had loads of masks and I thought I needed them. But she wasn't even talking to them all. She was talking beyond that, straight to me, to my truth. And when that ignited, I could see my truth. And I feel like that's the difference. We speak straight to the truth. We don't dive in the past or the future. We just stay present. And sometimes we, well, more to, we, we don't even, yeah, we don't go for the problem. It doesn't matter what, like, um, if it's mental health or uh, robbery, crime, we don't, it doesn't matter. We just talk to the um, to humans about what we do as humans, and it's just a beautiful conversation. Yeah, absolutely. And the men and women that I've worked with in prison um, have had hundreds of courses, hundreds of. Uh, I mean, you know, it's it's quite shocking when they tell you oh yeah I've done that five times and I've done this three times or whatever and they've done every course that because you know often that they can get a certificate or it helps them get uh, little perks in the prison or whatever so it looks good to their parole and so on so they'll often do a lot of courses even though they don't believe in them just to get those certificates and I think what's different about this understanding and the way that we deliver this understanding is, uh, as Wilson said, as Omar said, we're not treating any any problems. We're not we're not looking at, 
oh, that person can't write or that person's a, um, addict or, you know, whatever. We even say, I'm, I'm not, I don't care if you carry on committing crime. Like, I'm not interested in changing you or stopping you from committing crime. We even say that to people. Um, so first of all, that's refreshing. You know, they're, they're surprised by that. And they are, they have, um, do, you, do you have the term BS in, in Denmark? Like the bullshit factor? Um, they have really switched on bullshit meters. Like they know if something's, if they're being sold something or not. They just know they're, they're so street savvy. They're really switched on to that. So you get through their first filters because you're not delivering anything. You're not reading something from a book. You're turning up and saying like, oh, hi, you know, this thing has changed my life. Can I share it with you and just see if it's helpful? And they're going, you're strange, but yeah, if you like. <laughs> and, and then you are genuinely, you know, we don't teach. We don't teach people. We, we, we turn up, we listen, we share stories. And if people get inquisitive and curious, then they, they travel with us into a conversation and they hear things about themselves in that conversation. So it's very different. And Omar mentioned earlier about, you know, of course, there's nothing to remember. There's nothing to write down. There's not going to be any tests. You'll get, if you turn up to the classes, you'll get a certificate. Um, that's unusual. Again, you know, that someone isn't standing there at a flip chart teaching something while there's chaos going on in the room. For us, when there's chaos going on in the room, we use that to demonstrate what we're talking about. You know, we'll back that into the understanding. Oh, you know, look, look there. And eventually the men themselves see it and realize, oh, they're just in separate realities. Or, you know, if you just get present for a minute, you might feel differently, you know, they, and the room teaches itself. You don't have to teach. You just have to show up, be present, listen, um, see past the behavior and past the individual to the, to the truth, to the soul, and, and go from there. And, and you don't even have to know anything yourself if you do that. And, um, and people hear that and feel that and they feel it's different. Many, many people have said to us that they come because we, we're smiley, because they, we look happy and they go, I don't know what you're selling, but I want some of that, you know, whatever that is. <laughs> I'll, I'll have that. And then they see their own people that they've been living with walk out smiling and laughing and enjoying. Like we have the rowdiest classes, um, you know, no one has to sit and be silent or anything. And, and everybody else goes, what's going, is an aura, isn't there, around the room? <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Oh. People don't hesitate. Come forward. Are you all shy? Come on, we love questions, we love questions. Anything, nothing's off the table. Can you, can you understand us? Like, are we speaking clearly enough? Yeah. Sure. Well, to turn it around, not the most awkward, but the most amazing experience you've had with this understanding. Both of you. Wow. For me, it's simply awareness, and and that word, and just everything around that word, awareness. That has been the most hugest thing for me, because without awareness, I would still be in the same bubble, or without being aware of the 
those feelings I get or aware of what makes me unhappy or happy. Like without that awareness, I, yeah, I wouldn't see. I, I wouldn't be able to see where I went wrong or how how um I can change commodities or how things are the same or different. I wouldn't be able to access that without be uh, without that awareness. Yeah. How about you, Mama? Well, there's so many. I, I'm going to tell you another story. Can I swear? Am I, yeah. Okay. Yeah. No problem. So, <laughs> so I've worked in a uh, sex offenders prison. Uh, so a prison for people with, who have committed um, horrible offences like rape and um, paedophilia and, and things like that. And... Um, I was in this sex offenders prison and there was a, a and, and I worked with the people who had uh, substance misuse issues as well. And there was a man who kept turning up to grief. And in that, in that jail, in the one that I worked with Wilson in, um, they're all from London mostly, and they were all rowdy. And, you know, like there was lots of young people like Wilson and, there's lots of um, music and people creating all sorts of hanging off the railings and all sorts of things. It was very lively. Um, where, whereas the difference in a sex offenders prison is that they're they're more insular. You know, they don't mix so much. They're more lone wolves, let's say. Um, and so in group, they're really quiet. Like it's so hot. I, well, actually, <laughs> really quiet, like everybody here. That is really hard to get anything out of, of these guys. Anyway, this one guy, he was in his 50s and he kept turning up every morning. And in the mornings, they get their meds. So he kept turning up every morning and he was like all dazed, you know, from this very heavy uh, medication that he was having because he was uh, taking some sort of substitute for heroin and he had all sorts of other like anti-anxiety and all sorts like a cocktail of meds for breakfast and he would turn up and he'd literally just sit there like this like for all day all morning at least and he sort of woke up a little bit in the afternoon but he really didn't speak very much slept a lot of the time and I was with a colleague and we ran a group for three days and so same thing second day turned up mm -mm, and then in the afternoon a little bit listening and then dozing off and having a sleep never spoke and then on the third day he came and he was sat in his usual slump <laughs> and he suddenly went fuck I went what <laughs> he went it was me I was doing it to myself for the whole of my life. And we were, we were like shocked because we thought this guy has never, he, he hasn't listened to a word. And um, he was going, fuck, 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 fuck. And we said, oh, it's okay, it's okay. And he, and he said, no, it isn't, it's ridiculous. I've done this to myself my whole life. So anyway, he did calm down and uh, we said goodbye to him. And a month later, he was, he was not in the next group. So we said, can we go and see him? And we went to see him and he was 51. And for the first time in his life, he, had, he was detoxing from all his drugs. He stopped taking meth, um, what do they call it? That subatox or methadone, methadone, that's it. He stopped taking methadone. He stopped taking anti-anxiety. He stopped taking all the medications he wasn't taking any drugs legal or illegal and he, he looked terrible <laughs> and we said like how are you doing and he went well my my body is a mess like my body is screaming every day it's just you know I feel dreadful but my mind is so clear and he said for the first time in my life he was he was raped as a child and 
he'd started taking drugs at about the age of six. And he said, for the first time in my life, I can think straight. And, and that's it. My life's changed. I don't care. He said, I can go through this. I don't care. This is nothing. I can go through this. And, and it will pass, this body thing. Uh, but my mind is completely clear. Pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Indeed, indeed. I feel like dropping the mic. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And in a, in, a, in a way, though, Kim, you know, all your people here and yourself and, and Christian, um, it's no different. You know, like my stories are startling because of the contrast. And, and, you know, I can tell you that. And I know that I can tell you those shocking details and then tell you about this transformation and that you go, wow, that's amazing. And and so on and I, you know I'm, I'm i'm blessed to be able to tell you that but but really and truly it's no different from what you guys do you know from the from the stories and the conversations that you have with people that may not look so dramatic but they are because when i think about my own journey which was a very slow gentle you know, there was no massive moment and big change and everything. It's just slowly, gently changing and adapting into a new normal and a new me. Um, that's still massively powerful, right? Because look what I've ended up doing. And so uh, I just want people to know that. Big respect to you guys, too, for what you do, because it's the same thing. It's exactly the same thing. And, and I always say that even if all you ever do is, is you're nice to the barista or to the, the bin men or, to, you know, to like the people, the cat in your life or whatever, or you're, you're present with your, your grandchildren, um, that is changing the consciousness of humanity in exactly the same way that Omar and I are doing when we work with people. It just doesn't sound so dramatic, but it is changing the consciousness of humanity by being yourselves and turning up in, in that loving space in the way that you do and doing the best you can, you know, that is, that is changing humanity by being that change yourself. So I want to honour you guys and, and say thank you to you for everything that you're doing in the world. And we thank you also for being so inspirational. Both of you, it's been a great, great pleasure. And I'm very happy to say that we have been recording this. So many, many more can have the uh, full pleasure of uh, this webinar. So uh, thank you, thank you so much, and uh, hope to, so, to see you soon again. And, and before you end it, I'll say that we, we, we've done this webinar in, in honour of Christian. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you.